All right, Joshua chapter 1. Here we are in Joshua 1. They're about to enter into a, a time of warfare. And God has already provided the victory, and he's giving him some clear instruction here. The promised land was something that was guaranteed of God. And listen, when God makes a promise, he does not change his mind. But sometimes our doubts are kind of shortcomings or weaknesses that we have, you know. Uh, back before you know the history, this is the second time they're trying to enter the promised land. They failed. They had a bad attitude. They had a bad spirit. And it said that God put a breach in His promise. There was a 40-year gap in that promise. He was going to give them the promised land. They failed. He said, you're going to die. I'll give it to the next generation. That's what we see here in Joshua chapter 1. So here he goes. And they've been at a time of peace per se. And they're about to enter into a time of war. But look at what Joshua charges. Look at the charge Joshua gets from God. Look at verse number 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He starts out and says, listen, read the Word, get in the Bible, learn it, meditate on it, chew on it, think about it throughout your day, both day and night. Start your day with it, end your day with it. Make that like the bookends to your day and also your life. And if you do, according to all that is written therein, he says, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And listen, and he's defining prosperity and success according to the Bible. And as we go through dark times, boy, this is something we need to get a hold of. Listen, they were going through a very strange time. Their life, their family, their dwelling, it was all very fluid, if you will. Things were changing rapidly, and God was giving them a charge as they were about to enter into the danger zone. And he says, don't be afraid. First, get in the Word. Look at verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong. And of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Be not afraid. Say, so give us a charge for 2021. Be not afraid. We just passed out gifts to everybody in the church, a calendar. Every month there's a verse for be not afraid. Look, there are more verses than there are months, so I uh, had to pick the good ones, all right? But every month you're going to see be not afraid, be not afraid, be not afraid. Boy, I wish we had these calendars back in 2020. I wish we were looking at one for last month and for this month. The, the whole year I wish we were reminded of the promises of God. Whithersoever thou goest, he's going to be with you. Do you believe that wherever you go, God is there? Do you understand that God is on your side? He wants you as His people, as a believer in His salvation. He wants you to prosper and have success down here. Look, He's not talking about mansions and things like that, but I want you to know God is with you. You have a purpose in this life, and we don't need to forsake that. We need to focus on why we're really here. Our purpose. You say, well, but don't you know what they say? I know I get those every day. They say we're going to have a dark winter. We're going to be hiding from Biden, you know, here it comes, look out, eh, I don't know about all that, right? Then the other side, they say, well, uh, what about the 10 days of darkness? You heard that at work. I've heard, I got an email yesterday about it. We've all, the 10 days of darkness, boy, Trump's going to put down martial law, cut everything off, no internet, no cell phone, which our internet's not working this morning. I don't know why, but my phone is, so we're good, all right? But anyway, they're trying to say they're going to do some ritual on the solstice, and they're going to do all these things. Well, what if they do? Be not afraid. Amen. Be not afraid. God is with you. Because here's the problem. Fear has a tendency to paralyze you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know what to do. You know what? I've seen it this year where, oh no, things are changing rapidly. We just better stop and go home and quit working. And I'm afraid to invest or pay my rent because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So we'll just stop and we'll quit prospering and we'll quit moving forward. Those people have fell by the wayside. Those people are failing in life. In Proverbs chapter 3, stay right there, he says, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 25, he says, Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. Don't be afraid. Even when you're under attack, you have to understand our confidence is in God. God is your provider and your protector. He says, For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Do you believe that? 
Are you applying it to your life? Are you just looking at it like, I don't know, I read the news. It seems pretty dark. It seems pretty bad. We better just stay at home and hide and wait for all this to pass. Here, they're in a very weird situation, and he's saying, I need you to go forward. You're going to go into enemy territory. You're going to be victorious and successful. All of the promises that your fathers were too afraid to get a hold of, now it's come to you. And they had a choice. Were they going to be full of fear, or were they going to fear the Lord? Be not afraid. God is with you. Let me just open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would open up these scriptures and convince us of your power and your authority. Lord, I know that you love us and that you want great things for us while we're here. But Lord, you expect some things of us and you have goals for us. And I pray that you would help us to see that vision and to change our life so we can be used of you. Lord, help us to not be afraid anymore of what could come, but rather fear you and the loss of reward for obeying you. Lord, I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to preach this in a way that honors you and glorifies you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 1. Again, look at verse number 9. Look at this. Have not I commanded thee. This is a commandment. We're talking about two things. You know, i, I got to admit, my sermon this morning, I, I wanted to preach about the commandment of Jesus to be not afraid. He said it many times. And you ever, I, I, my sermon kept getting bigger and bigger. Well, i got to start in Joshua 1. And here I am in Joshua 1, and I'm like, well, i got to give some, some context, and i got to tell the history. And next thing you know, I've got two sermons. So uh, come back tonight. If you're not able to be here you know, this, this evening, please tune in for the sermon tonight. It'll be about the commandment of Jesus to not be afraid. But this morning, I want to talk about the courage of Joshua. You know, Joshua is a picture of Jesus in certain ways. Jesus' name means Joshua. And I know it's Christmas time. It should all be about the birth of Jesus. We're going to be talking about the death of Jesus tonight and his victories. But right now, I want to focus on Joshua. I want you to look at this. He says in verse 9 again, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Dismayed means you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm astonished. Do you, did you hear what they're going to do? Did you hear what they said they might do? Did you hear what the Federal Reserve's going to do in Congress? And Do you know what's going on in Germany? Be not afraid. God hasn't changed. God knows. And you know, it's interesting. Everybody says, well, I think we're in the end times because of maybe this and that. And hey, I get it. I know I see signs. But when you have to say, I think we're in the end times, that tells you we're probably not there. There are signs when we see them, we'll know. When we're saying, I know we're in the end times, we probably won't be able to have church and they'll be persecuting Christians in public for not serving some false god and receiving that mark. We know those things will come. So I think it's going to get bad. And I feel it could be this way. And I've heard it might be this or that. Listen, be not afraid. As we end this year, no matter what happens, your confidence is in the Lord. As we begin 2021... Stand on a firm foundation. You be not afraid of anything. Fear the Lord and Him alone and nothing else. Have not I commanded thee, he says. This is God speaking to Joshua. Be strong and of good courage. I want to talk about Joshua's courage because he believed this promise. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Go to Numbers 13. I want to give you a backstory about this. Go to Numbers chapter 13. Joshua had great courage. Joshua stood up at a time where they needed somebody to stand up and just be a man and not be afraid of the enemy and of what, uh, what all the bad could be. Uh, this is their second attempt of coming into the promised land. You know, first was under Moses' leadership, and he had taken ten men, each of the leaders, like great men from uh, these tribes, and he sends them in, and they're supposed to bring back a report. Eight of the men failed. They were failures. They had a bad report. It says they had an evil report. They were faint of heart. They were weak. They saw the great and glorious things, and they came back, and they were so scared that that fear spread. They began to share their fear and others consumed it and ate it up and they just wanted to lay around and cry and say it's going to be terrible and miserable and this ain't going to work. And they didn't believe the promise of God. They were weak. You're in Numbers 13. Look at verse number 25. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days and they went 
and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So Numbers 13, 26, he says, he showed them the fruit of the land. They showed them the figs and the pomegranates and the grapes. And if you go back to the Hebrew, I think that grape was the size of a basketball. No, I'm just kidding. Right? But it was obviously huge. Like they're bringing in some serious fruit and they're like, whoa, that's the land we want to go live in. In fact, they call it the land of milk and honey. Look at the next verse. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Now, milk and honey don't really flow in the ground like water. They're seeing cattle. They're seeing bees instead of wasps. They're seeing pleasant things like, man, everything we need to live and thrive and survive. Remember where they came out of now. They came out of Egypt, out of bondage. Uh, it tells us elsewhere they were eating leeks and onion and garlic. I mean, they're getting like all the bitter herbs that, you know, they didn't, that the, the Egyptians didn't really care for. You know, and so here they come into a pleasant land, uh, full of the promises of God. But what's their response? Look at verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. God's promised us a great victory, and we're going to look at the people, how big their cities are. Don't you know that Anak is there? Have you not heard the reputation? Think about what they're saying. They're coming back with a report, and it's fear. They're more worried about, instead of the fruit, they got the fear. Instead of all the blessings, they're more worried about the bad guys. Look at verse 29. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Listen, this is scare tactics from these guys. They're afraid. Uh, they're convinced of failure already, and they're actually using words to convince others of the same thing. The problem is, this is called the promised land. Think about this. Well, God promised us land. It's referred to as the promised land. God made us a promise. Well, they don't believe that. Well, you know, God gave us that land. It's, we'll be victorious when we go into it. They don't believe that. Instead, they're full of fear. They're telling you about the, the Amalekites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, right? Didn't God, actually, when he promised it, didn't he tell you you would take the land from them? It's kind of like, why would this come as a surprise? You already knew who lived there. Think about it. Verse 30, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses. Now, when it says he stilled the people, that's kind of like saying he calmed them down. They're all getting worked up. Oh, what are we going to do? This thing, hey, calm down, guys. Hey, whoa, we can do this. He's speaking good words. He's speaking life in them instead of death and destruction. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb had confidence in that promise. He saw no reason that what he saw in that land would prevent the promises of God. Yeah, but those are big people. How big's your God? Yeah, yeah but they've got walled villages. How can we knock a wall down? You ever heard of Jericho, anybody? Yeah. Think about it. These are like the guys, was it Gideon, where he, where he told them the ones that were lapping their water versus the ones holding on to their weapon. He's like, if you're too afraid, just go home. We don't need you in this battle anyway. These are the guys, these are what these other spies that came back. They're, all, all it is is bad news. We can't do it. It's not going to work. Look at verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. This is a destructive tongue. Look, this has afflicted us in this year more than any other time. Don't you know this thing's going to kill you? You're going to get the cold and your eyes are going to bleed and you're going to suffer alone and you're going to give it to everybody you know and oh, it's going to be terrible and miserable. Go hide in your house until they make a vaccine. I, I often wonder, what, what came first, the virus or the vaccine? <laughs> Now that we have the vaccine, are we going to see a spread of a virus? I don't know. I mean, you think about this. It's junk science. It's bad news. It's false information. It's fear. Fear. F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. Oh, we got to stay at home. This could be bad. Don't you know? I know one thing. God's with me wherever I go. I shouldn't be afraid. Oh, but don't you? There's armed men outside of that door. I forgot my gun this morning. I, I'm, I, God's bigger than a gun, ain't he? God's bigger than a bullet. 
God's bigger than an army. He's bigger than these men. He says, they are stronger than we. The strength that they lacked wasn't in their physical might. It was in here. They were weak in heart. They were faint. They didn't believe the promises of God. They were ready to give up and let go. They didn't want to go to the promised land. Yeah, but it's been promised. He promised victory and blessings and safety for your children and family. They didn't believe that. One of my favorite Proverbs, if you read your proverb of the day, two days ago, we uh, crossed that path in Proverbs 18. One of my favorites, it's Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. When you go to work and it's like, oh, this will never work. This is terrible. This is worse than it ever was. You're killing things. You're destroying things. You're being destructive. You're tearing things down. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You understand you have power of life. When you're surrounded with people saying, there is no hope, this is terrible, it won't work, you say, listen guys, we can do this. You be this Caleb, you be a Joshua, you be a Moses, you be an Aaron, you be one of the men that stand up and say, no, God is with us, we can do this, I don't care what they say, I'm worried about what God says. I'm more afraid of God than the economy, the industries, the, the, the wars, I'm more afraid of God that I know I need to be not afraid at every situation in life. Whether you're at peace or at war, love or at hate, the balance of life, we need to make sure that we're balanced in that. He says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You know what the second half of that verse means? If you love speaking life into other people, you'll eat that fruit. It'll come back to you. When you need it, when you're wore out and tore down, and you just don't know what I've been through this week, you've been speaking life into everybody else, don't worry, God's going to send somebody to give you something back. But if you love the fruit of speaking death into somebody, it's going to come back. It's going to tear you down. It's going to beat you up. Be careful with your words. I told you for years, my dad would say, make your words sweet in case you have to eat them. Make them sweet in case you have to eat them. I want to encourage you to stop speaking death and destruction into your family. 2020 has been a, 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 a devastating year. Words have destroyed lives, businesses, Families, wealth has been destroyed because of words. Oh no, I'm going home. I'm closing the business. I'm going to wait and see. I'll wait on the government to send me a check. Yeah, good luck with that. Still waiting on that second one. Words have destroyed health. Power of life and death in your tongue. And if you're speaking death, it's going to come back and tear you up from the inside. You'll get nervous and sick when you shouldn't be. When you're, and there's nothing wrong with your immune system. You haven't been infected by anything. You're just weak on the inside. It destroys you. Words have destroyed lives this year. I shared that article about the 90-year-old woman. She committed suicide because she didn't want to go through another lockdown. She asked the doctor, will you, will you just kill me now? Because I don't want to be locked down all winter. Forget that. That's sad. Listen, we need to be bigger than that. We need to be stronger than that. God has made you promises. Stop listening to the bad news. Stop getting it in your ear. You know, we have a habit. We, we get that little uh, endorphin kick. Oh no, did you see what they said? Who cares? Change your habits. Look in here. Look, we're going into 2020. Let's start the year by looking into this and abiding by what it says. Finding ways to change ourselves to become better people. Look at verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto. The children of Israel saying, The land though which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Those are some big dudes. And the land itself will devour the people. This is terrible. It's an evil report. This is an evil report of God's promised land. Think about this. God's made you promises. We all have different ministries in life. We have different opportunities before us. If you're married, well, then God has a family in mind for you and things like that. And you, I don't know if I can do it. I'm overwhelmed. These kids can't raise themselves and I don't have time and I don't get sleep and I don't know what to do next and I feel like I'm failing. Listen, you're speaking death into the promises of God. You're cursing the blessings that God's given you. You're single. You say, I don't know. Maybe the world will end before I get to get married. I, don't, I wouldn't say that. You never know what God has for you. Listen, I, I'll be honest with you. I felt that way 10 years ago. 
It's all coming. I mean, I might as well just hide out in the woods and stay single and I'll fight for God when the tribulation gets here. And I was lonely and lonely and I, all my standards were wrong in certain ways of the type of woman I'm looking for. And I finally gave up and said, God, I need your help. I can't do this. And he provided. Better than, I, than he could have ever. I, I just, I'm amazed at what God does. They bring an evil report of God's promised land. They're supposed to be not afraid. We have to stop listening of the evil report that's coming in 2020. It's your job to forget about that stuff. When somebody comes to you with an evil report, yeah, but don't you know what next year it could be? You just smile and say, it's all right. I've got God in here, and He'll protect me out here. And if it's as bad as you say, it's like I'll be walking through the crowd with a bubble around me. Nobody will be able to touch me unless God says it's my time. And, and if it is, then I'm going to go when He wants me to go. I'm not, not going to force a door open or force a door closed when God's doing something. Don't you know? Yeah, but there could be war. It could be pestilence. This virus, it's coming. The vaccine, even worse. I know, I know. Be not afraid. Have confidence. Have no fear. Look what they said in verse 33. And we saw giants. He said, there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So these giants were way bigger than us. They're huge, right? We've heard of uh, David and Goliath. I mean, this is what we're talking about here. A man, I mean, what, 10 foot, 12 foot tall? And you say, well, that's not that big. Okay, we'll stand next to one. Stand next to one because you think about, I mean, uh, you know, there's a difference between a five and a six foot tall man. And now let's double that. Let's keep on cranking it up. And you're going to feel like, okay, I feel like Shirley Temple in this guy's shadow. Like, man, he could just snap my neck like nothing. I, don't, I could give it all I've got and it'd be nothing compared to these giants. But they had God on their side. How big are the giants compared to God? They're nothing. Numbers 14, continue in the next chapter. Verse number one. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Oh no, the promised land is full of giants. The, the land is devouring people. The cities have walls around them. Why are we here? What are you doing to us, God? How do you think God felt when he looked down and saw that attitude? God, this is too much. Don't you know what you're doing? How do you think God felt when he looked at that as he's watching it? He said, stop crying, go to war, get up, take that blessing. I promised it to you. Why don't you believe me? They're calling God a liar. Go get your promise, you cowards. They don't trust what God's provided for. What if 2021 is worse than 2020? It's not my problem. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Have confidence in God. In 1 Samuel 12, I learned this as a song in another church years ago, and it sticks with me. It says, only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things He hath done for you. When you're afraid, you need to stop and say, I'm afraid of the future. I'm afraid for my job. I'm afraid for the economy. I'm afraid we're going to get hurt. I'm commanded to only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart and consider how great things He's done for you. Reflect back on the victories He's given you this year how He's protected you this year. I, I imagine a lot of people have refocused and they have a new vision and new goals just by coming through 2020. And we're not even through yet. You, you don't know what God has for you in this. Don't be afraid. Verse number 2, look at this, Numbers 14, verse number 2. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? Let me tell you something, there is power in your words. These men are saying, I wish we had died in Egypt. They came out, they were slaves, they were being abused, their children, I mean, this was not a good life. I was better off if we died back then or the wilderness that we just passed through to come up to this promise land. Why didn't we just die in the wilderness? What a statement. Let me tell you something. There's power of death and life in your words, in your tongue. And when you say things like, oh, my, I, I hurt my back. Or, oh, my back is killing me. Whoa, what am I saying? You know what? I feel my back. It reminds me I'm alive. Yeah, it hurts a little, but I'm getting through it. It's getting better already. Think about the words that you choose that's just killing me. I just hate that. This is the worst that it's ever been. You always say that. You never do this. You're tearing things down. Our words have a tendency to come back on us too. 
Here they're saying, I wish we died in Egypt. Oh, why didn't we just die out in the wilderness? It would have been better than looking into this promised land with this great fruit and these awesome cities because now we're scared to death. They're sitting on the precipice. They're on the edge of a cliff and they look over and they see disaster and God sees opportunity. God sees victory and they see, they, all they have is fear. They're filled with fear. Why didn't we die in the wilderness? There's power in your words. Make your words sweet in case you have to eat them. Make your words true and pleasant and honest and words of life. Building your own self up. Building your family up. Look at verse number three. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? They continue, they make it worse. Why did God bring us to this promised land to kill us so our children are victims of strangers? Their children were already victims of strangers in Egypt, mind you. And look, I know they're in the flesh. This is just fleshly human nature. Yeah, but if I die, who's going to protect my family? Probably all of us men think that way at certain times. Hey, prepare them now. I, I, I get that. But there's no spiritual power in that. Didn't God give you your children? Didn't he promise to protect them? Who is it that protects the fatherless and the widow? Is it not God? So what are you afraid of? Be not afraid. Isn't he protecting them now? You know, I think there's some deadbeat dads out there that God has every reason just to, okay, you're done. But he says, you know what? The deadbeat dad is at least protecting the family, whereas maybe the pervert uncle would move in if dad wasn't there. So I'm going to protect those children and that wife by letting them have a sorry husband. He'll let the sorry husband stay to protect them from the wolves. We never realize those things. We have to be careful. Don't say words that destroy things. That's what, Our wives and our children will become a prey. We're going to die in the wilderness. Just destroy us. Just enslave us. They're, they're saying, let's go back to Egypt. Look at verse 4. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation and the children of Israel. Listen, this is the sign of a great leader. Man, if your wife ever says, I've had it. This is too much. I'm leaving. You say, listen, I love you. You stop. Let me sacrifice. I want to keep you. I think as a leader, they had every right to say, yeah, you go and see what happens. It'll be nothing but destruction and devastation. You go, you'll get what you deserve. No, they fell down and prayed to the Lord. Lord, wait, help protect these people. Think about it. Verse 6, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. That's like, listen, stop. I mean, they're mourning. They're weeping. They're saying, whoa, don't do this. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't even talk like that. You're already hurting yourself. You're destroying yourself. This is just evidence of what's coming out of the heart. And so you've got Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron. They're fighting for the people that are fighting against them. Verse 7, And they spake all unto the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Positive words. Listen, this is an excellent land. We can do this. If God is on our side, who can be against us? Let's go get this land. They're speaking good things. And then they warn him, verse 9. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. He says, listen, fear God. Don't fear these people. That's like, <laughs> that's lunch to us. God will feed us these people. They will fall down before us, and God will pave the way. But don't fear them. That's rebellion against God. Listen, in 2020, I don't care what you hear. Don't be afraid. You be afraid of God and not the people. I don't care. What if it is war? Well, in war, you need a clear mind. You need a confidence of standing on the rock of God. What if it's peace and it's just poverty? Well, you need a, a clear mind to not be afraid. God can use you to deliver many souls. I don't care what happens in 2021. God's still on the throne. God still wants us to prosper down here. He has things for us to do, ministering to others, so we need to make sure we're not afraid. Look what their response is. Look what the people did, verse 10. 
But all the congregation bade, which means bid, like, hey, let's do this. They're bidding. He says, all the congregation bade, stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. So imagine this. These four men are standing in the gap saying, stop, what are you doing? Don't do this. Don't rebel against the Lord. Come on, let's go. We can get this land. And they're like, let's just kill them. Let's pick up rocks and we'll kill them. And then all of a sudden, I imagine everything shakes. It gets dark because, you know, the glory of the Lord, when it appeared, it was described as like uh, lightning and dark clouds, a, a cloud burning inside of itself. And I mean, all this dark, I mean, like supernatural so much, it probably scared them to death. We're going to kill them. Oh. All of a sudden, God gets their attention. He intervenes on behalf of these four men. They're told not to rebel against him. The glory of the Lord appears. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed against them? They're calling God a liar. He says, They don't believe me. They're calling me a liar. They're rejecting what I've said. He says, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. I will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. He says, forget these people. They don't love me. Why should I love them and protect them? They want to be away from me. I'll let them be. I'll disinherit them. They can go. Well, they have the bloodline. Yeah, but they didn't have the faith. These are the ones we read about in Hebrews where they fell because of unbelief. They didn't believe the Lord. They passed away because of that. These four men stood in the gap. Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Caleb. And he says to them, I'll make of thee a greater and a mightier nation. Well, yeah, but he's got millions of people. He needs them. No, God can use those four men and do a much mightier work than a million people that want to rebel against the Lord. It's not about numbers. It's about your heart. Moses asks for mercy. God gives it to him. God allows it. He protects the people. Look at verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit within him and hath followed me fully... Him will I bring into the land whither he went, and his seed shall possess it. Those people are going to fall away. They're going to die for 40 years. But this Caleb, he'll make it because it says, He had another spirit, and he followed me fully. You guys remember that old song, Trust and Obey? For there is no other way. That's what he did. He trusted in the Lord, and he obeyed what he said. That simple. But it says he had another, he had another spirit. Where did he get that spirit from? Wasn't it given from God? Right? Aren't uh, all good gifts, this is every good gift and every perfect gift is from above? You look at yourself in the mirror, listen, number one, don't get puffed up. We have a problem. Number one, we have a problem with pride. We look and say, yeah, I'm the guy, I'm the man. I can do this and I can do that and my talents are great and I am all this stuff. And then God humbles you and you realize who you are before Him and you're thankful and you begin to learn some humility and wisdom and apply it to your life. And then, you know, sometimes you're kind of like a beat dog, like, well, I mean, God, if you want us to do that, we will. But God gave him a great spirit for a reason. And he embraced it. He had confidence in what God had set him up to do. God had given him all the talents and gifts he needed. He had everything he had. He didn't need an excuse. He had everything to succeed. And he embraced it. He had a great spirit in him of, I trust the Lord. He's made a promise. It is true. Let's go. Let's do it. What a great attitude. That was given by God, and he didn't doubt God. Great strength is confidence toward God. It's not push-ups. It's not brain power. It's not IQ. It's not job title. It's not any of that stuff. It's confidence that God can use you. God has given you what you need. And sometimes we cower from that. Listen, me as a pastor, I, you know, some say, well, oh, he's not a pastor. He didn't do it according to our standard. He doesn't have the Pope's blessing, right? Others have uh, other attitudes about that. Listen, the job is easy. What? We help people, we love people, we minister to them, right? And it's like, well, God's given me this, so I need to embrace it. Your ministry is different than mine, but God has given you something to do. Are you doing it? Are you, are you fully persuaded that God's given you the spirit and the power and the blessings and the gifts to fulfill your ministry? This lady I was speaking with yesterday, 85 years young, she's ready to go. I'm, I'm just ready to go. Whenever the Lord will take me, I just wish you would. Would you pray with me for that? Broke my heart. And I told her that. I said, you're breaking my heart here. You're making me cry. She feels like she's finished her course. I said, but you know, your, your time is not up yet or God would have already taken you. Right. 
You still have a purpose to serve. There's someone here you can help. There's someone in your family you need to talk to or connect with or someone somewhere you need to open your mouth to. You have someone you can be a blessing to. All of us are in that situation. Except we have a few more years, don't we? Remember the people said, we, we were better off to die in the wilderness. That's it. Why don't we just die in the wilderness, right? Look at verse 29. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. They were destroying their own blessings with their mouth. They had a promise. They rejected it. They destroyed themselves. Look at verse 36. And the man which Moses sent to search out the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing a slander upon the land, that evil report, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. They died on the spot. They got sick and died in front of everybody. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephuni, which were of the men, went to search out the land, lived still. Go back to Joshua 1. Go back to Joshua 1. I'm sorry, it's taking a little bit longer to get where I wanted to go here, and I'll cut it short, but I want you to see this in Joshua 1. Listen, in 2021, don't be afraid. Be not afraid. We've been given great victory by God. We don't know what it is yet. We have promises of God. He wants us to be victorious. I heard a guy say, hey, don't you know a, a setback? is a setup for a comeback. Right? I've been knocked over. I'm on my back. Hey, at least you're looking up. Now get up and go. Well, we've been set back by 2021. Will we ever recover? There is no new normal or old normal. or what, what is normal anymore? You've been set back. Hey, you're ready for a comeback. These men were ready. This was their second chance to go. Here's the promised land. Same guy, Joshua, ready to lead the pack. He was only fearing the Lord. Now after the death, look at Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Now think about that. Where your foot steps, it belongs to you. Yeah, but wait, is, is, is this God's land? Are, are, are we still blessed here? Is the Lord still with us? Do we still have church and sing praises and preach the gospel? I don't know. Should we keep going or do we back up? Take a step forward and find out if God's with you. He said, everywhere your foot goes, it belongs to you. Do you believe that? Amen. We're stepping into 2020, Lord willing, That's right. and it belongs to us. Amen. God's given it to us. We have a victory on the other side of this year. He says in verse 4, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the great Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites under the great sea going down unto the sun shall, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Yeah, but they're giants. Not any man will stand before you. I will not leave thee. I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. God is with us in 2020. God's going to be with us in 2021. Yeah. You mark it down. You have some confidence right now as we go into this next year. Look at verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou, now he makes it personal, hey you, be strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. He says, if you reject my commandments, do you think I'm still going to bless you? Look, we're saved by faith alone. Thank God for that. It's called everlasting life. It's a free gift. But you better begin to obey and He will bless you here, and you can do great and mighty things. Be strong when it comes to observing all according to His law. He says, "Which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not to, to away, turn not from it to the right hand nor the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest." True prosperity is not earthly mansions or political power. Even while we're here, God gives us life and health and blessings and family more than we deserve. But we have rewards to look forward to as well. Let's not forget that. Look at verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, 
that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. I don't care what the economy has, if you will commit to learn this in 2020, to read this in 2020, uh, in 2021 as it comes on us. Next year, if you will commit to study this and think about it and chew on it all day, all night, share it with everybody, you will succeed. This is a promise of God. Verse 9, Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. I'm going to stop here. i got more to say. We'll say it tonight. Listen. Whithersoever thou goest. Wherever you go, God is with you. He wants you to be successful. He wants you to have victory, but it's up to you. He says, be strong. Stand up against the evil. Have courage when you're surrounded by darkness and the enemy. And do what he said. And we'll have a blessing next year. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you. Thank God for 2020, the life, the health, the wonderful things you've done this year, Lord. Help us to reflect on where we failed you and focus on doing more for you next year. Lord, I pray that you would give us a blessing in 2021. You've given us a promise here, Lord. We see the vision for soul winning and uh, getting people excited for serving you in their life. And Lord, I pray that you would just show us how to do it. We ask these things, trusting you to answer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.